Hi, this is Dr. Dan Guerra coming to you from Verev Med and Authentic Biochemistry Studios in the Inland Pacific Northwest. Today is the 2nd of December and the year is 2019. So we're really getting close to closing off this year. And I'm getting really close to um, finishing this arc of discussion of T-cell. Um, first of all, physiology and biochemistry, and then leading into diet event ontological perspectives as it relates to disease, particularly we're going to be talking about autoimmune disorders. Uh, so that's what we're going to be getting started on. So why don't we just go right ahead and uh, do our slide presentation. All right. So this is coming to you <clears throat> from exactly where you see it there. I'm only a uh, stone's throw away from that scene. That is the Clearwater River as it comes down from the uh, foothills that eventually lead all the way up to the Bitterroot Mountains and then up into Montana. That's pretty far away from here, but that's where that basically leads to. So um, we're going to get started with this lecture. And hopefully um, we're going to get um, down this river a ways. So again, I'm going to be talking about T-cell dye event ontology. Okay, now this slide here is showing you how different T cells differentiate. So you can start off with a CD8 or a CD4 cell lineage. You start off with a CD8, and in the presence of interleukin 12 with increasing transcription factor known as TBET, you're going to end up with a cell that has TBET, and it's going to also have this BLIMP1, both of which are transcription factors. And when you have that in combination with the uh, chemokine receptor, CXCR3, again, in the presence of interleukin-12, that CD8 cell is going to turn into a cytotoxic T lymphocyte. Now, you take a CD4 cell, give it the same stimulus of interleukin-12, and you also have the um, chemokine receptor expressing. You see that on the surface of the cell. And also with increasing Tbet, what you get is only Tbet expressed. Okay, So CD4 cell is going to give you T-BAT and not also that BLIMP1 as transcription factors, that's going to turn into a TH1 lineage. Now, TH1 in the presence of interferon gamma is going to give you a TH1 full-blown inflammatory response. And you're going to get expression of the chemokine CXCL9 and 10, and also that receptor, which are ligands for that receptor, which you know is being expressed on the surface. Now, cytotoxic T lymphocyte uh, in under the influence of interferon gamma, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine in its own right, will also give you a Th1 type of inflammatory response. But note that that cytotoxic T lymphocyte is going to function differently than Th1 when you get down into the granularity of how one functions over another. Th1 is going to be ultimately working through T cell receptor, whereas cytotoxic T cell doesn't need that. Okay. Now look at also CD4. In the presence of uh, interleukin 12 and 6, okay, that same CD4 lineage is going to start expressing BCL6 and TBET because you're getting increasing TBET concentrations every time you, you're going from here to here. See, that's what that's showing you there. And now that cell lineage, okay, is going to turn into these T follicular. That, that's what these are now called, T follicular helper cells, TFHs. Now, they're a specialized subset of a CD4 lineage, right? Just as it says here, they were first identified in the tonsil, um, which of course is an immune organ. And they play a critical role in protective immunity, helping B cells, which is another lymphocyte, right? Produce the antibodies against several foreign pathogens. So those follicular cells are going to be cooperating with B cell lineages. So TFHs are located in secondary lymphoid organs or SLOs like the tonsil. Uh, and uh, spleen, and of course, in all of the lymph nodes that are in the periphery. Okay, and that um, linkage there is where I'm getting this particular slide. So I want you to understand, once you make this T cell lineage here, this TFH, in the presence of interleukin-21, interfer more interferon gamma, which is all over the map here, it's going to take a, uh, a, a, a GCB cell, okay, just a standard B cell, and it's going to turn into a BCL6 B cell. It's going to start producing IgG2A, 
And ultimately, that's going to differentiate into a plasma cell, a full-blown plasma cell. Notice it's also got transcription vector blimp one, and it's also got this gamma bat, right? So it's got it, it, um, it's got the same, or excuse me, T bat. So both of those transcription factors are functioning in B cells, but it's a totally different cell lineage. Here you're going to start getting Ig2A. Okay, so now you've turned on a B cell response to a specific antigen. <clears throat> now take a look at Th17 cells. These are a different T lymphocyte, obviously. They're going to be expressing Roar Gamma T. So if they're a TH17 cell, they're going to already be expressing this transcription factor. Uh, and I've talked about it already, but it basically it's a retinoic acid orphan receptor, Gamma T subclass. And so retinoic acid's involved. It, it's part of the co-transcriptional machinery that turns on gene expression in the TH17 cell, retin retinoic acid. And in the presence of interleukin-12, just like we've been doing all the way through these lineages, we're going to make a full-blown Roar Gamma T. We're going to start turning on T-BAT. Notice we also have the chemokine receptor, CXCR3, now expressing well. And that's going to help with the Th1 inflammatory response, too, in, in the in presence of more interferon gamma and uh, interleukin-17, interleukin-17 being generated by these cells. So all this is going to aid in this really pro-strong pro-inflammatory response using those ligands to bind to that receptor. Now, ultimately and finally, I want to talk about Treg cells. Treg cells, when they're expressing FOXP3, that's their transcription factor, that's their <coughs> canonical transcription factor. And the presence of interleukin 27 now, different cytokine, it's going to start making Tbat. So now you've got FOXP3 and Tbat, and that's a Treg cell that's going to shut down or suppress these Treg just be called T uh, suppressor cells. It's going to suppress this whole Th1 response. So it's going to put the brakes on the pro-inflammatory response. You see here with the same sort of repertoire of um, microenvironment, only with slight differentiation of different cytokines, you're going to turn on the Treg cells, and it's going to put the brakes on this entire inflammatory response. And that's the way that inflammation normally is controlled so that you don't have runaway inflammation because normally you want to have the inflammatory response, you want to get rid of whatever the invading pathogen is, for example, bacteria, virus, fungus, or any cells that are expressing unusual antigens, right? You want that inflammatory response, but then you want the Tregs to come in and put the fire out. And that's normally what happens. So again, with a slight differentiation because of a different cytokine, in this case, the influence of interleukin-27, you're able to shut down that system, and that's what we're looking at here. All right. Now, it's a paper that was published in Frontier Immunology back in 2015, so about four years ago. This is showing you how the T cell receptor works, also known as CD28. So the T cell receptor, <coughs> once ligand binds to it, and actually the T cell receptor is kind of complicated because it's interacting with antigen um, being offered be an MHC class two uh, bearing um, antigen presenting cell, like for example, a dendritic cell. So when you have that triggering of the T cell receptor, you're going to turn on phospholipase C gamma. Okay, so phospholipase C is going to take a phospholipid like phosphatidylcholine and make diacylglycerol. Okay. And so when you make that, it's also going to remove, of course, whatever that polar head group, in that case, it would have been choline. That's what phospholipases C do. Now, DAG is going to turn on a calcium-mediated response. So the product of that, that, uh, that uh, lipase reaction is going to uh, cause an influx of calcium, which is then going to bind to calcineurin. See what calcineurin does here is very interesting. It's going to take a phosphorylated N-fat protein, this is the N-fat protein, so upon TCR stimulation, N-fat right here, plus AP1, SP1, and the Kreb ATF all bind to the promoter of the FOXP3 gene. Now imagine, this is the FOXP3, and I just told you FOXP3 is T-reg cell, okay? So the imagine this being a T-reg cell. So what you have to do is you have to remove the phosphate from N-fat. Now N-fat can enter into the nucleus, and they can interact with various regions promoter regions, enhancer regions of the uh, uh, FOXP3 gene, okay? So that's the whole process you're looking at here. So you've got this FOXP3 gene that's going to have the regular promoter 
Then it's going to have these non-coding sequences, one, two, and three, but each of those are enhancer elements. So you're going to bind their own transcription factors, specific canonical suite of transcription factors. So you see the promoter's got Fox 013 bound to it. It's got a phosphorylated dimer of stat right there. It's got the RUNX13, okay? which you're going to see here later is going to be turned on by TGF beta. Remember, we were talking about that transcription factor always having influence over all the T cells. It's going to have a CREL cell, and there's your NFAT, right? The NFAT that, that was just generated by this T um, uh, TCR response, right? So the T cell receptor is going to bind to its ligand, uh, which is often an antigen, and it's going to turn on this whole system, okay? And that's going to be dephosphorylated because of calcium, because of calcium being generated because of kinase reactions, which are led by DAG, which is a product of phospholipase C gamma. Okay. So this is a lot of lipid mediated. c -REL is also involved. So you see where all these proteins are coming down the pike. Now, the other thing T cell receptor turns on is uh, protein kinase A. So that's going to work directly with this ATF and this Krebs system here. And you're going to get that also mobilized, right? And see it down here. There's where CREB is. Remember, that's the cyclic AMP response element binding protein. So another transcription factor, but it's not binding to the promoter, right? It's binding to the CNS type 2, right? So this, again, is another part of the enhanced realm. This is, this is non-coding sequence, right? So this is going to be a portion of the uh, upstream um, region of the FOXP3 gene, right? Because this is what you're looking at. This is, entire thing is one huge promoter. And these numbers here designate where you are relative to the open reading frame of the gene, right? So you got the canonical promoter, you have CNS1, CNS2, and CNS3. So here is where you have CREB binding, you have another phosphorylated stat dimer here. You have also FOX013 there, CREL, just like in the promoter region. And you also have RUNCs here, right? But not the RUNCs13, just RUNCs by itself. And that's CNS2. Now, let's go and find out how we're making this process here, CNS1. What the transcription factors do you need there? All right. First of all, interleukin-2, uh, working through its receptor, is going to uh, cause STAT to be phosphorylated, dimerized. It's also going to take th uh, this uh, SMAR protein, and it's going to uh, block STAT3. So STAT itself is going to be phosphorylated. We just saw that STAT phosphorylated is on the promoter and on the CNS um, enhancer element for the gene that we're going to be making. It's going to be canonical for, right, canonical for the Treg. That's the FOXP3 promoter we're looking at here, right? All right. So that's how interleukin-2 interacts. That's how the T cell receptor interacts. We looked at all of that. Uh, by the way, the phospholipase C, DAG-mediated, uh, uh, phosphorylation of all these proteins, P38, ERK, junk, these are all going to be involved in uh, mobilizing APT, and APT is going to also make it down to this promoter, see it here, and also in the CNS1 enhancer element of the promoter. Finally, the TGF beta receptor, and under the influence of that, you got these two SMAD proteins, they become phosphorylated, they make a uh, heterotrimer, SMAD2, SMAD3, SMAD4, with phosphate added to two of the canonical uh, amino acid sequence regions of SMAD2 and SMAD3, but not on SMAD4. Uh, you're ultimately going to then uh, translocate into the nucleus. Now you're going to have phosphorylated SMAD, right? And that's going to end up now down there. See, it's going to be in the CNS1. So now you need that also to turn on this particular region of the enhancer element. The GF beta is also going to uh, run the run X313, which is going to bind to the promoter region. So all three of uh, these systems are working. So I just told you that STAT5 forms a dimer response to interleukin-2, right? Uh, and signals and translocates to the FOXP3 promoted periphery, TGF beta. Signals drives the SMADs and NFAT occupancy at the CNS1 region and may induce FOXP3 expression as well. That's what's showing down here. And the CPG island within the FOXP3 promoter region. So it's not showing you the granularity of this. Now we've got to look down here is also regulated. So Epigenetic modification of the promoter, you get methylated cytosine residues on the CPG for a naive CD4 cell, but in a TT reg, a thymus TT reg, it's demethylated and you acetylate, that means you're turning on the gene, but in a peripheral T reg, you also have a demethylated CPG and an acetylate system. This means it's on. Now, that's opposed to the CNS2 element, in a, in a naive CD4 cell, you, you have it methylated, so that's quiet, right? Then you demethylate when you get to a thymus 
associated Treg. That's the demethylated CPG or acetylated histone. And, and then the peripheral Treg, this region uh, is remains methylated, right? But you don't have any acetylation going on. So these are all the epigenetic modifications on top of all this canonical um, transcription mediated control because of ligand binding to receptors all on the surface of the cell. So now it's a mouthful, but that's what's going on. So looking again at the Treg cell, I told you that you need to have an antipresenting cell, for example, a dendritic cell. It's going to have T effector uh, uh, cells associated with it, right? So any TFs. You're going to have CD80 and CD86, which are going to be regions of the uh, antipresenting cell binding to the CTLA4. Now you'll notice the CTLA4 is actually something that gets targeted when you're when you're trying to target T cells so that you can uh, activate them. So normally if you have CTLA4, it's not activated, you can turn down T helper cells and shut down the immune response. This is like an oncolytic re uh, research. Here you're seeing CTL4 uh, uh, associated with the CD80 and CD86, the angiopresenting cell. You have T effector cells making some interleukin-2. These are any old T effector cells, Th1, Th2. They're going to bind to this promote to this receptor here, CD25, right? They're going to occupy those sites. You're going to have a core Treg module with lots of FOXP3 as transcription factor. It's going to be jacked up in CTLA4 positive cells. It's going to be jacked up in CD25 positive cells. And what's going to happen is you're going to have, start getting interleukin-2 diminished, right? You're going to start de decreasing that because you don't need as much of that because you, all you need is a small amount. So you titrate the Treg with that otherwise pro-inflammatory cytokine. Now, that's the core Treg module. Now, Tregs can also turn on a pathway that looks more like T helper cells, meaning the effector cells, right? So you have THX, that means any kind of particular TH, TH1, 2, or 17, like transcription factors where you have a THX homing receptor specific to make a Treg look like a T helper cell. And you also have this TX, THX cytokine mediated response that gets jacked up as well. How? And these TH, THX sub like Tregs, the T follicular ones we already talked about, lots of FOXP3 and BCL6, homing receptor for them is chemokine receptor 5. A TH1 type of lineage is FOXP3 T bat. We've encountered this before. That, of course, is the canonical chemokine receptor 3. TH2 has now IR, IRF4 as a co transcription factor with FOXP3, and its homing receptor is going to be. Uh, this particular chemokine uh, receptor 8. And for TH17, lots of FOXP3, but now STAT3 being expressed, and you're going to have CCR6 being the homing receptor for that lineage. So again, FOXP3 acts to control the core module, okay, that's the core module uh, of Treg suppressive function by regulating expression of a number of key molecules like CTLA4 and CD25, which are necessary to, to drive Treg activation, right? That allows Tregs to suppress T effector cell activation proliferations by suppressing the APC function via that CTLA4 and possibly depriving interleukin-2. It's, it's, in other words, it is titrating away the interleukin-2, which would otherwise, because it's a pro-inflammatory cytokine, be aiding in the Th1 pro-inflammatory response, okay? It's titrating, or that is, it's vacuuming up some of the interleukin-2, okay? In addition, an additional, excuse me, THX-like module, which I just went through here, of suppressor function may also be induced that causes Treg to express more like TH cells. And we just went through how they differ according to the subunits and how they differ in their chemokine receptor-mediated responses. All right. So it's a paper published in Experimental Molecular Medicine, volume 51, published in 2019, a couple of months ago. It's talking about yet another protein that's involved in Treg regulation called nuclear factor interleukin-3 or infil-3. It's also known by another name, E4 binding protein, uh, so E4BP4. It's a repressor of numerous genes, okay? So infil-3 contains a basic leucine zipper domain, so that means it's going to be interacting with DNA, right? Comprising the amino acids on that protein, 73 to 146, among a, a number of, uh, the total number of residues for this protein is only 462. The interminal part of infil-3, of that particular domain, directly binds to the DNA, so it's going to be a transcription factor, like I said. 
uh, while the C-terminal is responsible for the homo heterodimerization of the protein itself, which also aids in the function, and therefore it's going to be um, put, repressing a lot of genes in the Treg lineage. That's what's going to happen. Amino acids 299 and 363 comprise the transcriptional repression domain, repression domain sensu stricto. Invil 3 represses genes by recruiting a histone deacetylase 2 and a G9A histone methyl transfer. It's going to start jacking up methylation of histones, which is going to shut down gene expression, the ones that are necessary for Treg expression. Fox P3 expression in Treg, so Treg activation gets subdued, gets tanked, gets put down. And that deacetylase, okay, that what that does, and HDAC does, is it generates euchromatin to heterochromatin, shutting down gene expression globally. So it regulates diverse biological processes, including circadian rhythms. The NFIL3 does a lot of things it's been described for. Uh, cellular viability, whether or not the cells are able to divide. And in fact, it's also involved in a lot of hepatic pathways, just in general core metabolism, like in carbon metabolism. So it's a very unique uh, uh, enterprising transcription factor. Here we're just talking about in T regs. So in immune cells, infill 3 plays a key role in B cell IgE, right? So that particular immunoglobulin is often uh, involved in what? In autoimmune responses and also in recognizing things like foreign antigens, right? So that whole process, such as in um, uh, various kinds of respiratory autoimmune diseases like asthma, IgE gets uh, jacked up, IgE class switching occurs because of infill 3 in the B cell lineages. And, and you also get the development of natural killer cells from the infill 3. Infill 3 binds to its Ig epsilon promoter and it stimulates IgE uh, production. IgE again is the immunoglobulin, particularly linked to a cinephil mediated um, uh, pro-inflammatory responses often in de dealing with um, foreign antigens that it can cause an allergic response, allergic responses, right? amongst other kinds of pro-immune uh, designations. Infill deficient mice show dramatic NK cell loss, natural killer cell loss, uh, natural killer cells tank, and that's due to the influence of the factor of natural killer cell development early on, which of course involves gene expression, and even maturation and function. So all three uh, stages of uh, NK life pattern, development, maturation, and function all get influenced by infill 3. Infill 3 deficient mice also exhibit elevated interleukin 12, P40 expression in colon, and that may be associated with inflammatory bowel diseases because that induces a Th1 differentiation and that can cause spontaneous colitis in mouse models, okay? Th2 cytokines are also affected by infill 3 with increased expression of interleukin 5 and 13 uh, in the infill uh, double negative line of the Th2 lineages, right? Furthermore, infill links the circadian rhythm with immune cell development by suppressing Th17 determining factor in that all important retinoic acid orphan receptor gamma T transcription factor which is so important and paradigmatic for the TH17 lineages. So here's some hypothetical deductions from this paper. Transcription factor infill 3 directly controls Treg activation, then studying either its knockout or overexpression might trigger an opposing sequential. In other words, we'll be able to see what's going on uh, in sequence from that phenomena. If a non-activated Treg normally expresses negligible infill 3, as compared to a constellation of CD4 T cells and naive cell lineages, then overexpression should give the greatest fold effect. So that you're starting from a baseline and jacking it up from there using the naive T cells. And since infill 3 um, reduces FOXP3 expression, we know that means it's going to harm Treg activation because it binds its promoter. And uh, in fact, it's going to be associated with those three different non-coding sequences, right? CNS is one through three on that FOXP3 promoter. It physically interacts then with also on that promoter as acting as a suppressor of gene expression for FOXP3, but also interacts with FOXP3 protein directly. Uh, and that likely uh, works both ways to basically cause Tregs to be tanked, okay? To be shut down. That's what I mean by tanked. All right. For this paper, they had inbred mice stably expressing FOXP3, which is regulated by the green fluorescent protein, and a FOXP3 creactuated yellow fluorescent protein line. So as they see yellow fluorescent protein go up,
they can follow the expression of FOXP3, right? So it's a reporter gene system. Isolated CD4 cells in vitro induce them with cytokines and growth factors like you just saw in those other slides. And so you can differentiate several different lineages of Tregs depending on how you use your cytokines and growth factors. They use RNA, quantitative RT-PCR, real-time PCR. They use a monoclonal antibody flow cytometry uh, system to uh, link to the membrane-associated cytokine receptors and transcription factors so they can pull out those cells and look at them specifically and see what's going on upon looking at this whole process, right? They also did a chip, right, that's a, um, a chromatin immunoprecipitation and then stability assay to see whether or not the whole um, chromatin remodeling is stable or not, or the cells are stable even, and an RNA sequence platform to find out what RNA is being made. And they use all these reporter genes like the green fluorescent versus the yellow fluorescent protein. Okay, so they did a lot of work. This is basically a summary of a lot of the work. A here are all the different genes differentially expressed between Treg and non-Treg. So Treg over non-Treg, the red are going to be more expressed, they're increased. So you've got the interleukin-2 uh, receptor, you got FOXP3 coming up. This is like 15-fold increase, 10-fold increase. That's what those numbers mean, right? This one is 8-fold. The NFP1 is 6.4-fold, interleukin-10, 4.5-fold. You see what I'm saying? While there are genes turned up in Tregs, there's some that are turned down. Infill-3 is turned down. You see about two-fold. Uh, interleukin-2 itself is turned down. You see some of the genes that are turned down. That's what you're looking at. Here's a protein blot, a Western blot, looking at infill-3 in three pro-inflammatory T helper cell lineages, one TH1, TH2, and TH17, lots of infill-3. Treg, uh, not so much. In fact, very little. There's beta-actin as your control protein. You can see it's not changing at all. That's just your control. All right. So we talked about this. Infill-3 messenger RNA expression. Each subset was measured be this quantitative real-time PCR. So here we're looking at, again, just infill-3. A lot of it in Th1, some of it in Th2, more in Th17 than Th2, not very much at all in Treg. And that, again, suggests that infill, when it's expressed, suppresses Treg activity. And that's, again, now we're looking at flow cytometry of splenocytes, same kind of thing, right? We're looking at an array of the gene expression. Here, you kind of flipped it upside down. You can see that you're getting a lot of FOXP3 in these splenocytes. If they've got the FOXP3, now Cre is a site-specific recombinase, which is going to swap out the promoter region for this yellow fluorescent protein so that you're going to get more yellow fluorescent protein made, right? So that's what this is showing you on this flow cytometry map. So that means you're going to make more Treg. And this TD tomato, that's going to be your other uh, reporter system, it's going to, it's going to flatline. No more of that's going to increase. It's not going to increase because you're only increasing because you've got this, uh, uh, Cree recombinase, which is now basically jacking up Fox P3 and you're measuring it partially by looking at yellow fluorescent protein using this flow cytometry. And you look at what genes are turned up because you know that Fox P3 is behind it all. So you have X T regs, you have non T regs, and then you have T regs themselves. T regs are number one. And you can see here how much uh, of, of this system is now being promoted, pushed over, because you've done this recombination with FOXP3. And you can see the XT regs and non T regs are both of them not making any more yellow fluorescent protein because they're not using the FOXP3 Cree recombinase, right? So showing you the reporter gene works uh, in, in doing the flow cytometry, and that then when you look at the end of phenotype of the different proteins that are being expressed, uh, at, at the RNA level, you can see here that they're very similar when you were looking at Treg versus non-Treg lineages, right? And these are splenocytes. So that's what that data shows. Uh, one more data slide. So TGF beta signaling down regulates infill three. So there's your naive T cells. They have a certain concentration of NF infill three RNA. Uh, TH naught. Those are like your naive cells. A whole lot more, like than just as plain old CD4 cells. But when you have TGF beta, you get much less of that in the naive cells. So you're tanking it, TGF beta, shutting down infill. Um, okay, so that's shown there. Um, and you're using a CD8-28 CD uh, antibody because you, you want to make sure you're in the right cell lineages. So cis, which is a compound which inhibits SMAD. Remember how SMAD was involved in that enhancer element region to turn on FOXP3? 
So inhibition of SMAD allowed infill to rise. You see how infill rises when you inhibit SMAD. That's what CIS is doing here. You're increasing the amount of this inhibitor of SMAD. So therefore SMAD cannot downregulate infill. And so you get infill jacking up. That's just showing you this is a TGF mediated response, TGF beta mediated response. So basically it's showing you the Fox B3 levels the same. As you increase the amount of inhibitor to SMAD, you get uh, more Fox P3 that's going to be made, right? So that's what's showing you as you increase it, okay? Um, and it, it basically, this is showing you this CIS3 is working the same three, same way through the GGF beta system. And that's what this paragraph says here. Inhibition of the GGF beta signaling pathway leads to an increase in infill expression. That's not good because it's going to shut down Tregs. Whereas a decreased Fox P3 expression, that's what we saw up here, okay? You see it decreases it here, right? from uh, these, this TGF beta without having the inhibitor. You add the inhibitor, you start to get less and less. The data suggests that infill 3 expression is regulated by the TGF beta and uh, specifically by the SMAD3. We already saw where that's linked up in on that slide, that cartoon slide where I showed where SMAD3 is involved. So basically the evidence that infill 3 stops Treg activation and it does so by inhibiting FOXP3 expression. Upon infill overexpression, so the overexpressing lines, Interfere on gamma or leukin 13 mRNA levels increased in Th1 and Th2 cells, respectively. Those are canonical for those. While those of interleukin 17A and FOXP3 decreased in the Th17 cell lineages and in Treg cells, uh, respectively. Consistent with the RT PCR data, full cytometry analysis of protein expression showed the interferon gamma and interleukin 13 levels increased, while interleukin 17A and FOXP3 levels decreased when you do this to the system in response to the infill overexpression. When I do, when I say do this, I mean you're overexpressing infill. Together, the results suggest that infill enhances the Th1, Th2, that's pro-inflammation, while it inhibits Th17, and it also tanks Tregs. Overexpression of infill then attenuates FOXP3 expression in Tregs. Infill represses FOXP3 promoter region and reduces the expression of all the other Treg uh, marker genes that you're interested in. Infill may bind to the FOXP3 gene to control its expression, of course, uh, to test that hypothesis, they used a chip assay that, again, is a, um, a way, a immunoprecipitation of the chromatin to look at what you have there, what proteins and what DNA is there, right? So you can look at what promoter region of the DNA and what proteins are associated with that promoter region when you do an immunoprecipitation of the chromatin. That's what a chip assay does. So you have a naive CD4 uh, T cell lineage. They're transfected with control and with infill flag. That's just so that you can purify the protein uh, overexpressing, you know, how much is there, basically quantification. Uh, culture under Treg polarizing conditions, you need that. You have an anti-flag antibody and you use to precipitate the infill three because you've made this uh, uh, protein. You Basically, you've made a fusion protein with infill three. The chip results show that infill three binds directly to several regulatory elements in the FOXP3 gene, including the promoter and all three of those non-coding sequences. They also examine infill 3 physically interacts with FOXP3 and controls its activity. So they did protein-protein interactions with co-immunoprecipitation assays, and they found that infill does indeed co-immunoprecipitate uh, with FOXP3. So basically, infill attenuates Treg cell stability. Overexpressing T cells, uh, Treg cells have Th1-like gene profile, which means they're pro-inflammatory. What that ultimately means is you transfer CD4 T cells with controlled Treg cells. You can suppress inflammation. If you have NFIL3 overexpressing Tregs, you're going to lose that suppression. NFIL3 has a negative effect on the immune suppression ability of Treg cells, both in vitro and in vivo. I'm going to skip the infill here and a few more of these stories. I want to get to the end of this particular um, segment because I want to finish early because I want to be able to give you the rest of this lecture uh, in real time. So we're going to say... Uh, let me move my up here. I'm going to look you right in the in the camera, and we're going to say, as soon as I move that up, bye for now.